Gate and to this uh, in conversation uh, with Mark Guinan and Dr. Neil Connolly. My name is Eva McGowan and I'm the director of uh, DRIFT. Um, just to let you know a few things, uh, you can see there are four microphones in front of us. Uh, we just wanted to record um, the session today, so I just wanted to let you know that we are recording it. So, And if there's a conversation afterwards, which I'm sure there will be, um, that you, you will be heard and possibly broadcast on a podcast somewhere in the ether. Um, so just to say that. Um, I'm delighted to be able to host this uh, conversation today. Today's uh, Mark's last day of his exhibition, um, so it's particularly apt, I think. So I just want to give you just a little bit of background, I suppose, in terms of Mark's work here. Um, in spring 2014, uh, Drift put out an open submission call we got 130 submissions from that. Out of that 130 submissions, 19 artists were chosen for a studio visit, which meant essentially I went around and had 19 different conversations. Um, and out of those 19, 11 artists were chosen for exhibition. And Mark was one of those 19. So obviously the competition uh, in terms of uh, that is really quite high. Uh, we were particularly interested in uh, Mark's work, not only because he's a locally based artist, but his practice was something that we were really interested in supporting. Um, we have, I think, gone on a journey together because the work that you see here today is actually very different to the work uh, that Mark submitted um, originally. So there were quite a lot of emails and conversations around that. Uh, but Drake, as I say, was uh, particularly uh, happy to support Mark and his journey, um, and so here we are. Um, Maeve, I'm just going to do a short introduction about you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Maeve Connolly, uh, we're delighted to have Maeve with us uh, here today. Maeve is a writer, researcher and lecturer. She's a full-time faculty member in IADT, uh, and she um, co-directs ARC as well, which is a master's programme in IADT, and Mark has just started that. So I think that will be it for me. I think that's enough of an introduction, and I'm just going to hand you over Thanks. to you guys. Thanks, Eva. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Um, well, I know it's a, it's a Saturday uh, lunchtime talk, so we're sort of planning that um, we'll have a conversation for maybe half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up to your questions. But if you have questions in between, you know, feel free to join in. It's pretty relaxed. Um, so. Mark, uh, I'll just say a few words about Mark's biography and also about the connections that exist between Mark's research and the MA programme that I co-direct at IDT. So Mark's a graduate, a recent graduate of the BA in Fine Art at the DIT and that's a four-year programme and prior to that um, Mark has a, has a history of, of working in construction and we could perhaps come back to that, that could be maybe interesting. And so <coughs> having completed his uh, his uh, fine art BA. He's just started on a new uh, program of study. It's a two-year MA in and ARC stands for Art and Research Collaboration. So it's an MA program that is uh, offered by IADT, so Dunleary Institute of Art Design and Technology. And it's it's a program that's a bit unusual in that it's based not on the campus in Dunleary, but actually we work um, primarily at the lab, which is the Dublin City Council Arts Office space, which is in the centre of the city. So the lab, it, as the name suggests, is um, a space that emphasises experimentation and investigation by artists. And I think there's a very specific set of connections between that context and the way that Mark works. But the lab is, is one of the main places where we meet um, as a group of educators and students. And it's a very diverse student group, people <coughs> coming from a range of different backgrounds, some people who have very studio based ways of working that we might recognise as quite, I suppose, typical of how we imagine artists work in studios with materials, but some work in other ways and they do other types of research that maybe involve documentaries or um, developing publications or performances, so it's quite a deliberately diverse uh, <coughs> community of artists. And it's a two-year program, so we're really at the very beginning. In fact, the first uh, day of term was two days ago, so <laughs> it's quite uh, kind of new um, for us. But uh, I'm I'm familiar with Mark's work 
because I first encountered it at a critique that was a joint event between the students at the BA, the BA in IADT, uh, and it was a collaboration between uh, the BA program and the DIT program that um, Mark was studying on. So that's, I'm realising there's a lot of acronyms in there, so IADT, DIT. So we have uh, developed a habit, uh, which we are very enthusiastic about, of bringing our students from Dunleary to the DIT, its new campus in Grange Mormon, and they then reciprocate, they come and visit us, and we have a kind of mega critique, where we have maybe 80 students show their work, um, usually it's a selection, they decide amongst themselves who's going to show work, and the tutors from the different uh, teams respond, they don't know the students from the other college, and they respond to their work, and they ask maybe different kinds of questions. So Mark's work was some of the first work that we saw when we went to the DIT, and that was a very interesting experience, um, because his tutors had been on a kind of journey with him of, of development and investigation, but for us it was quite new to see this work, and uh, generated a lot of interest and excitement amongst our students, a lot of questions about painting and what painting is. And I think those are, are really important questions in Mark's work. And so since then, we've, we're really pleased that he's, he's decided to come study um, on the art program. And he has a number of awards, which I think are worth, worth mentioning. The DIT Graduate Award um, for Excellence in Fine Art, so that's uh, quite significant. Um, an Artist in Residency uh, Award from Fingal, and also the Residency Award at Driot. So he's also exhibited quite extensively. He's exhibited at Mart, for example, which is um, quite an interesting space in Rathmines. He's exhibited his work in, in uh, Broadcast Gallery, which is a gallery space that's um, run by the DIT, um, which was a great initiative. And he's had many other um, exhibitions. So he's quite practiced in e exhibiting, but also, I guess, we can go back to this, every exhibition is an opportunity to um, explore new approaches. So that's quite a lot of talk for me. Um, I'm really pleased to, to, to be here and um, Mark and I kind of discussed maybe five or six topics that we're interested in opening out and um, the first of them was really maybe the most obvious one which is Mark's methodology and um, there's a little bit of information in the, um, the statement uh, that's here which explains a little bit about how, how these works are made mm. but there's a lot more to say I guess. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you first, Maeve, for coming, and thanks for to the direct for giving me this opportunity to have this talk. Um, <clears throat> I sort of feel it's relevant as the show is ending to sort of answer any questions for people who have come here, and I appreciate anyone who has come to for the talk and has come to the show as well. Um, you know, I understand that when people come in first, because I have this a lot on my grad show, that when you look at the works, it's quite confusing as to what you're actually looking at. You know. And um, I've read a lot of the comments that are in the book and can see that that's how it's been here too. So, you know, it's quite um, pleasurable for me to be able to actually finally sort of answer any questions for anybody who might sort of think, what are they, you know? And, um, and the question in the title of the show, like what is painting, sort of spurs on an interest straight away, you know? Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, in regards to process and what I, how, they, how they're made, these works are all a continual investigation into what paint is and what it can do. And this sort of comes from um, near the end of third year and into fourth year in college, <clears throat> I started to realize that for me to investigate abstraction and to stick with painting in inverted commas, that I'd have to sort of maybe think about what can I bring that's new. Like painting in the last maybe 100 to 150 years, everybody's doing everything with it. And um, I wrote my thesis on Barnett Newman and his effects on American minimalism movement. And um, I started to realize that, you know, for me, painting and this whole expressionistic or illustrative purpose to painting might not be relevant for me and that I might need to go the other way, which is what I did. So when I came into college in fourth year, the first thing I did on the first day was I started thinking about just the basic makeups of paint. You know, I said, I'm just gonna just stop everything and I'm just going to look at what is what is acrylic, what is it made up of and that's where it started with me. I actually went and bought acetate and I started trying to play around with the makeups of binder and um, pigment and what happens if I add too much of this and too much of that and then spread it and leave it for a day and 
there was lots of mess and there was lots and lots of tins of emulsion paint and uh, my uncle is a painter, uh, a decorative painter and I just went and raided his shed and brought loads of paint into college and just started pouring it on stuff to see what would happen if I paint, if you mix the acrylic and gloss, what happens? Two different colours, if you add water, if you add white spirits, if you add uh, linseed oil, what happens? It speeds up the speeds of drying time, etc, etc. And then I started to realise, I, I felt more like a, a, a doctor or a, a scientist going into the studio because the first thing I did was got changed and then it was just mess, you know. And um, these sheets and all that you're looking at now are sort of products of that investigation, you know. Um, in the second semester of fourth year, you're sort of getting pushed towards your grad show. So there's a pressure on you to try and think of what are you going to show for your grad show. So I needed to start nailing down what can I do. And by that time, I had found a way to create a form that was 3D, that was made of just a manipulated sort of concentration of paint. And I said, right, how can I make this bigger? And that's really what the, the second semester of fourth year was about, was trying to get from a, a metre size sheet to an eight foot cheese. And these are the products of what I came what came. I knew the drift was coming as well. And I was like, right, I need to find something that I can make, that I can use on my grad show, mm. and then further furtherly move them on then for my uh, for my show and drift. So that's where that came from, you know. Um, and one of the things that some you know one might sort of expect when we think about painting, um, we perhaps we have, maybe all have different expectations of what a painting might be, but in these works, they are very obviously very sculptural. They're very three-dimensional. Mm. They're objects. And you mentioned there Barnett Newman as one of your references, but you also mentioned in the, in the text, that, um, the, the sort of press release, you mentioned minimalism and you mentioned objects, autonomous objects. Yeah. So do you, can you say more about these as objects? Well, I sort of see all these as individual objects, you know. Um, I'd like to call them paintings, but I could easily understand why people would call them sculptures, you know, and especially the bigger ones. Um, but my research into Newman and also into Robert Ryman, who'd be more present now, and even artists like Alexis Hardin and artists who are interested in materiality within their work, are all sort of touching on the same type of idea. And I sort of realised, especially from Newman's work, it was really, really misunderstood till nearly, till nearly when he died. His work, he was part of the abstract expressionist movement in the 1940s, but yes, his work really didn't take any sort of off, didn't take off at all until the 60s, you know, um, until the world was ready to accept, you know, like Rothko was dead, you know, Pollock was dead, and, you know, Newman was sort of still around, and here he was doing this minimalist stuff, and... and the word minimalism and the American minimalist movement was starting to take off. Donald Judd, who had become friends with Newman, was making these pieces of furniture that were literally just objects. And his work sort of is very much about autonomy and about the stillness of an object. And I sort of said, I want to bring that into paint and I want to think about Newman's work, but not as a flat surface. And Newman's problem, and he talks about it in his work, is that the zip line within his work was the only way that he could make his paintings 3D, you know. So I started to think about, like, what can I do now, 70 years on, what can I do to try and make them even more interesting but still keep them within the painting realm? So this is where this idea of autonomy and stillness within the work, now not so much in the small pieces but very much so in the big pieces, each one of them sort of has their own sort of thing going on. And Newman talks about the relationship between the eye and the colour the colour fields, which his works were, they were a large colour field, they are still large colour field paintings, and he talks about the relationship between the colour field and the human, and the experience of the viewer, and I wanted to try and recreate that within the drift, to try and to create an experience where you're standing in front of this, you're not 100% sure what's supposed to be going on, but there's a certain beauty there, an aesthetic, sort of a pleasing aesthetic to look at, and I think I've achieved that. You know, within the works. When you look at the works, the fracture, the bubbles, it, they're just paint, but they're not just paint. They've got the sort of, they've got their own sort of thing going on, you know, and I've and that's what I've tried to achieve within the works, you know. One of the things that, that um, occurs to me is that when when I saw some of your work earlier, the experiments that you were doing in the DIT, <coughs> at a certain point you were testing out what it might mean to place work on the floor. 
and there was a kind of some conversation at, at least about would there be a difference between say looking at something on the floor or looking at something on the wall and when you talk about um, objects particularly in the history of minimalism and this might be a history that some people know or don't know but often what was happening is there was a very strong relationship between the human uh, sort of encountering an object and the difference that you know that occurs when you walk around something. Mm. So when we're dealing with sculpture, we 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 move usually. The, the sculpture generally not always stays in one place. Yeah. And we walk around it, so we have a sense of the scale of the object in relation to our bodies, and that's maybe helps us to think about the differences between objects and the buildings that enclose them and house yeah. them. But you're very much using the wall here. Did you think about maybe not using the wall, or was it always the case that you um, wanted to use walls? <laughs> The floor, I resisted the floor. I, I actually, I did use the floor within my grad show with yeah. these sheets. Um, I created two different pieces where there, there was one where there was the gold was rolled up in a roll and I just had it sitting on a pole and you could walk around it. And then I also had a, another piece where three of the sheets were draped over different size pieces of like wooden structures. And I realized too that, that yes, they were successful to a point, but. I think the work didn't really, it was taken from what I was trying to achieve mm -hmm. because there's a psychological thing that goes on that once you remove it from the wall, it's not a painting it's anymore. Not a painting, yeah. And for this particular show, like myself and Amor discussed it several times about using the floor, but the area, the gallery space and how it works, the floor wasn't really viable here for yeah. me. You know, it was discussed about the floor. I was going to do a large piece and drape it down the wall and right across out of out of all those sheets just make one long piece but in the end i chose not to because i i, I wanted to make a selection of examples that show tension mm -hmm. and all the other stuff that i'm interested in within paint and also as well i had to sort of make the work in relation to the space mm -hmm. that was being provided you know would i rule out the floor no i wouldn't rule out the floor i wouldn't rule out anything now but for you know. this show, I understand then, so for you, it was very important to have that rule of um, thinking about the limits and the tradition of painting and using the wall as a way And also as well, stuff. the sheets, this is not the way the sheets were presented in the grad show. Like, they have now got a frame, there's a support structure with inside them. So the work is also about questioning the idea about display. You know, like, that's another big thing with me, display and the installation of the work. Like, making the sheets and having them is one thing. And in the grad show, I explored manipulating the sheets. Mm -hmm. But then I started to think about display. And this is the other thing around painting. Like, who says that the painting has to hang straight? You know, Ryman questions this in his work, where he exposes the, 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 the pieces that are hanging, the works, you know. And he's very, very much interested in what they look like on the wall and what if you move one off centre. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason why these are all, none of them are hanging straight. The only thing that's common about all these is, is that the hanging point from the floor is the same point off the floor for all the pieces. That was the only thing that we really talked about. And also I decided there was going to be four here, two, two and one. And when these were being installed, the points of reference were centred off the wall, etc, etc. So that was the only thing. But when I came to install the works, it was a three day process and all these sheets came in just in their frame and flat. And then it was really about me sort of coming back. The first day I put them all hanging up and left them. And then I came in the next day and I was just like going, oh, these are not working in here at all, you know. And then I started to play around with this idea that what if I fold them back on themselves, you know. Let's just play around with this. I have this space now. I can really do what I want with these sheets, you know. And this is when I started to play around with the folds and try to make them look like, and I think I've achieved this, that they all sort of look like they're sort of in the middle of doing something. They're like you're watching a video of them falling and they're paused. And I wanted to try and make them look like that because I sort of feel that that in itself, the animation of them in itself makes them successful, you know? And I sort of tried, wanted to achieve that. So I came around to my little bottle of water that I had. <coughs> the girl outside was looking at me going, he's off his head. And I just went around and I moved the bit and held it because these pieces are mainly uh, PVA and acrylic. So they're in a stable position at the moment. But like if I was to throw water on them right now, they would disintegrate. You know, like they're solid as long as they're dry. But if I was to add water, they might not be so nice looking. Well, maybe they would be nice looking on the wall. 
So when I was uh, installing these, I was able to use water to get them to stick back on themselves. I was able to use water to create the folds and creases that you see within them now. And um, yeah, it, the installation was really, really, and it was really difficult. And on the third day, then I sort of got to it, you know, where I wanted to be. And one of the, the conversations we were having when we were walking around the show earlier, you mentioned that the work that has the sort of gold or bronze and silver, um, that's just on that wall there, that you had, you, you felt that that was a work that could be visible from outside. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's more reflective than some of the others. So I guess I was interested in how much the setting and the architecture of the building like, had you thought about that before, or was that just a kind of <coughs> something that you, you considered when you started installing, that you would want something to be visible to people outside? Well, I'm really familiar with this space, yeah. because I live close to it, yeah. and I'm here all the time, you yeah. know. So I sort of knew, I knew there was definitely going to be one on that wall, yeah. and I knew there was going to be something on this wall. And I know when you're walking by, especially in the evening time, that that one gets the most view. Yeah. And these two here get the second most view, because they're most visible from outside. So out of all the pieces, that one, that one, and the one on the wall are my favourites. So they were going onto the place that were most visible. And also as well, and this probably sounds a little silly, my son, who's nearly 10 now, this gold and silver one was the last one that I made. And I asked them, the kids, what do they want? What do they want to make? And I said, they make, they said, make a gold and silver one. And I was like, really? And, and, that's, and that's where the gold and silver one came. So... The gold and silver one is more of a homage to my son. He walks by any time he sees it now and he looks in and he smiles. So it's achieving what it needs to achieve, yeah. you know. So the gold and silver one was more about that, you know. Um, and when we had the opening, he was straight over to it. He couldn't believe that I actually did it, you know. <laughs> but it actually, and it was fun for me because it's metallic paint. And if you look at it closely, it has a whole different thing going on than any of the rest of them. Yeah. Within, within the mixture, you can see, you can see different stuff. So that's a whole other avenue there to look at for so me again. So it opened up some new questions for you. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, because the metallic the metallic acrylic paints look totally different yeah, than normal yeah. acrylic paints. So there's something going on there that needs to be looked at, you know. Because I think in the, at some point in the text, there's a mention of folds and the history of folds as a connection to tradition. Yeah. Um, could you say something about that? Well, I was just going to hang them really, really straight mm. at the start first, you know, and just go the whole Newman Road that the piece just hanging by itself in itself is doing loads and yes it is but the toilet shows what is painting and if you think back to Van Eyck or Carvaggio or any mm. of the painters that were really really interested in clothing and portraiture and the importance of, of, of getting this meticulous photograph if you like at the time right and I said to myself okay right what do the folds represent now so the folds are more of a homage to painting in general yeah. And like it's actually quite strange to think that like I was able to create the folds instantly with paint, whereas 150 years ago a master could be working on a painting for years to try like Caravaggio especially and Van Eyck in relation to their portraiture and their skills around painting, they were being paid to create these sort of really lush, well dressed people. It wasn't just about the faces; it was about what they were wearing and the creases were so perfect. Now we can just do it on our phone straight away. And I was thinking, right, there's something in that that I can just do this instantly with paint. There's not even a brush involved. It's just paint and I'm just bending it back on itself. So each one of these are a sort of as well, they're sort of a, number one, a sort of a acknowledgement to painting history. And also as well, I'm showing off a little bit like, cause I'm sort of saying, look what I can do with these. You know, these are paints and this is what we can do with them. And they're there. You know, so there's a little bit of that going on. And it does bring up some interesting questions about the idea of skill, because, I mean, this is something that is a big debate in art schools these days, about, you know, when, if you move from having a traditional fine art programme, where you have the painters, you have the sculptors, you have the printmakers, um, it, the, the sort of traditional apprenticeship or academy model would be that the painters would learn from the more experienced painters, they would learn a set of techniques, such as, for example, how to paint vel you know, something that looks like velvet, yeah. or how to produce a, a really convincing illusion of lace. And, and those uh, traditional skills, painterly skills of displaying your ability, that's often what that kind of, say, you know, the Dutch masters, they would often showcase their, yeah. their skills, and they might specialise in, in being someone who paints you know, patterned fabric, for example. But in the art school system now, we, we have moved away from those uh, a, a sort of 
academic models towards um, a more open model. And I think it's interesting that in the DIT, they're still, it's still called a fine, it's a BA in fine art, and there are um, sort of distinctions that people can, can follow um, a little bit, but the, the teaching staff is, in, in most cases, while they're, they're their role might be nominally sculptor or painter. A lot of them work across different media. And in IDT, we don't even use the term fine art anymore. We, we, we just have a BA in art. And we are very uh, cross-disciplinary. We give our students technical workshops in, in second and third year. But actually, most of our students will say, well, I'm an artist rather than I'm a sculptor or I'm a printmaker. But interestingly, there are always some students who will say, I'm a painter. Um, or I'm a printmaker, they will want to use that term. And I, I, I suppose it's, it's maybe it's an obvious question, but would you define yourself as a painter or as an artist who works with paint? Mm -hmm. Or does it matter? Um, if you'd have asked me that question a year ago, I'd have said painter. Mm -hmm. But over the last year, um, I've started to realise that I would describe myself as a visual artist interested in paint. Yeah. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do next with the mm -hmm. paint, but I'm going to do something with it. You know, um, I have all these like ideas in my head about where I need to go next, um, and spent a lot of time in here thinking, okay, this this show and everything that I've achieved to get to this point is just a comma on the bigger picture. You know, um, I'm sticking with painter for now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For now. Yeah. You know. So then the kind of next question that I have, and something that has come up already, is this idea of experimentation. Because, I mean, certainly on the MA programme that you've just started, we're placing a lot of emphasis on, it's a two-year course, but in the first year, really, we're constantly telling people, experiment. Keep, keep open the question that you have. And as you develop your question, don't feel that you have to determine the outcome. Um, my co-director, Sinead Hogan, is very fond of telling people, you don't research what you already know. You know, if you already know the answer to your question, then you're not going to keep pursuing it. So you, you go into <coughs> territory that's unknown. Um, so for your sort of, the, the journey that you think you, you want to continue on, do you feel that you have a, a, a kind of, an idea of experimentation that maybe comes from, for example, materials technology? Because that's something that mm. when you talk about looking at pro properties of what acrylic can do, what happens when you mix different quantities of materials, you're actually very close to a materials technologist who, who might, they're, they're, they might do this kind of testing for a whole other set of outcomes or, or, or reasons. Or working for a paint company. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I luckily got a space off Fingal to work in, mm. and I've been there now about four months, and three or, three or four months, and I, it's in a recycling centre, and in the recycling centre there's a paint recycling area. Which is like very exciting. Really exciting for me. And uh, I was only there about a week or two and one of the guys was there and I said to him, I get on quite well with him and I said, You know, does anyone ever bring paint in here? And he said, Oh, you want paint, do you? And he brought me down to this place where there's like they take in like fifteen wheelie bins a week of paint that people don't want and it's every type of paint that you can think of. So I'm like words of gummage now. I'm in the bin every time I go over. The first place I head for is the bin. And I have about 300 tins of paint of all these different types of paint. Really expensive paint, yacht paint, etc., etc. So it's like the mad scientists when I go in there now. There's like seven or eight experiments going all the time where I'm just pouring this on this, take a photograph, write it down, and then I'll come back in a few days. But like when I go in, it's exciting. It's like unwrapping a present. It's like, what, what's happened? You know, some of them, they react really great, some of them don't. So I've already started to think about using these sheets now as a springboard for the next series of work, which will probably be me painting on these sheets again now. Yeah. This is, I see these, these forms, these especially, as, as, as a ground for okay. paint on paint. You know, so you're, you're not really precious about these being fixed objects that will go into a kind of storage and... Oh no, no, I can't see that happening. I'd say they're going to be cut up and painted on. Okay. You know, I'd say so, yeah. Some of them will, yeah. You know, like, that's what they are, and that's part of my work. I'm in a recycling centre, let's recycle some of the works, you know? Yeah. You know, there's a thing around that as well. It's like yeah. my financial position and yeah. my position within, within what I'm doing so it has to sort of get me to think about the practicalities of 
of my work, yeah. you know, and I have a ground to paint on, mm. you know, and I have already made several works where I've mixed several different types of paint in a sort of a controlled way, well, as much as it can be, and I've allowed the paint to react with each other within the sheets, and there's this whole thing of paint on paint, and I'm allowing the paint to do itself, to do a pretty much actually what I was doing in these sheets, mm -hmm. except I'm just going a step further now by bringing in all these lovely paints from the bin and throwing them on and seeing what's happening, you know. I'm going to open it up to the audience in a minute, but I just have like one or two last things I wanted to ask. I mean, the one sort of very quick one is, is that really dangerous? It sounds like it might be. Like, because if, if paint has Well, the paint, windows are open. Okay. That's all I can say. Yeah. I know, I, I come in and go. Yeah. The place is down the road. I go in, I do a bit, and I run. Yeah. You know, so no, it's fine. Okay. I'm just, because I think, I think it is actually because... Uh, <laughs> No, we're yeah. good. Yeah. We're good. Okay. I think. Um, the other thing is that I think the idea of, of recy recycling is quite interesting in relation to kind of it. It, it sort of connects with a, a bigger debate, which mm. is and a bigger set of questions that I know that myself and Sinead uh, and others on the art program are very interested in, which is the environmental and ecological aspects of thinking about art and also thinking about media, because a lot, a lot of my research actually looks at media technology as well as art and the relationship between them. And I think it's, it's an interesting situation that artists are in, you know, that they very commonly have to um, not just make things, like they, they, they combine and um, mix together new materials, whether it's paint or wood or whatever it is, they make material things, they make them from, from different components, and then they sometimes have to think about, can I, can I afford to store that? You know, I've, I've had lots of conversations with artists about this tragic experience of having to throw out their art, you know, or having to pay a lot of money to store their artworks. And that's why it's, it's always great if you're an artist whose work is selling because, you know, you don't have to pay for the storage, the gallery shows the work, a collector buys it, and the work leaves you and hopefully goes to somewhere where people will care for it. Mm. And, and it, its journey continues, but you don't have the burden of being surrounded by these things that you made. But every now and then, and it's very common in art schools, it's a sort of tragic, sort of funny aspect of seeing abandoned artworks in art schools, something that someone has really labored over, and then at the end of the year, it's in a skip, or they just don't know what to do with it, mm. or it's brought home to their mommy and daddy who gets stuck with it for the next five years. Mm. You know, they're told, I, are they told to sell it for them? Doing that. Yeah, so, so I started I, just, just, on, just on, on, on that point. Yeah. Recently, actually, I had a conversation with somebody around painting, mm -hmm. and they pointed out to me, and I've really, this has been in my head since, that people are bringing paint to this place to get rid of it. Yeah. And to them, the paint is finished with it and of no use. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's only the paint's begin, beginning journey. So the whole recycling thing around making work with stuff that one person is finished with but it's actually a tool, like it's a really good tool for me to have. Yeah. There's something in that, there's something in this old rickety, like I've, I've found several tins of paint that are rusted, it could be 10 or 15 years old, yeah. they're sitting in someone's shed and someone said, right, that's it, I'm clearing my shed out, and they brought it down, and the work that I'm able to create from this yeah. paint, yeah. you know, so there's definitely something in that, and my work is, is, is slowly being pulled towards that, yeah. and on the grounds of, 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 of what I've achieved already, you know. I'm just going to open to the audience to see if anybody has any questions. I mean, there's possibly things we never touched on that are maybe obvious. Colour. Yes. <laughs> that was my kind of pull back question, but yes, it is an obvious one, I'm sure. Why my choice of colour? No, just um, could you talk a little bit about your relationship to colour and um, your use of colour in, in those particular paintings and the combinations? Well, the choices of colours, especially within the larger works, were more about me trying to sort of simplify that down. You know, black, white, red, complementing green, the, the blue and the white. I wanted to keep it not so much about the colour, but more about what the paint is actually doing within the colour. So, if I was to make sheets where they're like really mixed colour or expressionistic, brush strokes, then it would be about that and not about what the actual paint is doing within itself. So I try to keep it really, really minimal within the colour and keep the colour stripped down. But yeah, colour is obviously important. Absolutely. Because, uh, you wouldn't have, you would have done more black or white otherwise. Yeah. So um, is it the, partly the, the way that you can see the folds within the uh, kind of tone of the colour and that sort of thing, does that interest you? Or? 
colour is always of interest to me, you know. Yeah. Um, and in these works, like, I got to really play around. I had about 80 sheets made of different colours, every type of colour. Like, each one of those has a colour on the back as well, an opposite colour. So I just had 80 sheets and loads of frames, and I was like, right, what am I going to do with these? So I got to play with ideas around colour within these. So colour, yes, is really important, really important to me. But within these works at the moment, and especially the larger ones, I wanted to keep it really, really simple. And again, just acknowledge the basic ideas around painting, you know, red, green, you know, this idea that like, I'm aware of the basic colour rules, you know, and that putting up something that was like purple and green might be a bit of a faux pas, you know. So I wanted to try and acknowledge I'm aware of that <coughs> in the colour choice. But it is a really, really, really important area because certainly, I mean, you mentioned Rothko. If you think about, you know, the experience of a, of a Rothko painting is often one of that certain optical effects that are being produced by by the way the paint is sitting on 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 the canvas or on the ground, and the the way that certain colours might draw us in, others might kind of push us back, might might seem to kind of almost hover on on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And I often think of Rothko's work as being very much about the, that relationship between the, the, the sort of um, the surface of the canvas and this kind of sense of, of depth um, that's very, the works are actually way quite sculptural, but they, they acquire those sculptural properties through the kind of op the optical effects of yeah. colour. But I think that your work is very different, um, that your work the colour choices seem here, they seem almost like a set of, you know, of tests and the way that they're hung in relation to each other. We can see how they connect to each other. And the one with the red circle kind of half folded on the green seems the most um, sort of literally optical in terms of what, what it might be doing. Like the red-green relationship um, seems like it might be a relationship where colour is particularly important. But in some of the others, the 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 colour properties are, are they're, they're letting us sort of think about the materials maybe differently. Yeah. There's a sort of a mixture of both, like you could, you could like on the black one at the end, there's green and blue, or there's orange and blue you, so I'm acknowledging the colour there. And then, you know, purple, white, two sort of off-tan colours, green and red, you know, there's orange and blue acknowledgement again, and then the second and last one, and then there's, you know, I was working within the materials that I had as well, you know, yeah. so like I didn't have a, a spectrum of colours to work for. You had sheets of materials. I had sheets and sheets yeah. of different ones and, and frames and I said, right, this is what I'm going to do with these. But always my intention within the small works was, was to more just demonstrate this is what you can do with these, this is what you can do with this material. Like, and all of them are just on a frame, there's no support structure, the paint is the support structure. So each one of them is a frame, there's a colour sheet wrapped around a wooden frame and then there's another piece brought in to show off what I can do in relation to tension or etc, etc, you know. Are there other questions? Oh, there's a few. Um, uh, they're lovely, Mark. Thank you very much. And any time there's a show or a concert in Dree, if we come down 10 minutes early over the last few weeks, I have another Thank look you. at them. Very tempting to touch them, but I've yes. resisted that temptation. Um, well, I want to ask you just a technical question. How, when you pour your paint out onto the tray or the floor or whatever, that you stop the adhesion of the paint to the surface that you pour onto, that you can pull it off again? Well, acetate was the first thing I was painting on. Okay. Non-resistant surface. As, as, smooth as, 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 yeah, as, as smooth as possible. Okay. Glass would be ideal. But I need to be practical about glass. Glass isn't going to work unless I buy small sheets. A mirror would be ideal. Anything that has really, really less resistance to it. And in the end, for these larger ones, melamine boards. You know the stuff that's used for making um, the f nice furniture in IKEA. It's the really, it's non. Yeah. There's non-resistant. Yeah, yeah. And that melamine was actually I got help through DIT to discover that. And uh, I realised that I couldn't afford an eight-foot sheet of glass. And like the logistics around trying to move one of those around, especially within the space that I was working, and the melamine board was the answer to that. <coughs> so, non-resistant surface, but it also it allows me to think I can go bigger. I can keep going bigger if I can find something big enough, I can paint on it, and it will not resist the chemical makeup that I've tweaked over the last 
say four or fifteen months is allowing me to peel pretty much off anything that's non-resistant. Yeah. You know, I have to go right back there. I have to get in there and see what's going on because I don't want to paint trees and I don't want to paint something that's illustrative. I want the paint to be illustrative. So what can I do to make it illustrative and make it interesting? So that's where I'm back in that. I feel it's a justified sort of a journey where I need to be in looking at what happens when this and this thing and why is that? You know, even down to the basic idea of water resistant oil, <coughs> excuse me, that idea even in itself. And you know, you can bring that into painting straight away once you mix up oil paint with anything, there's something goes on. And in the works that I've been doing recently, I've been videoing this reaction where I pour a, a water-based substance onto an oil-based paint, both different types of paint, and then record it with a video, and instantly there's a reaction. And I can never repeat that same reaction again. It's an event that has just happened, which brings me back to my ideas around, um, in my thesis within Newman, and it, within Rosenberg, he talks about the event on canvas. And I think that that's still very, very relevant, that I can still show these events, and that painting is, in fact, the objects that I'm trying to display, you know, and paint. And it's just something as well, of, uh, though we're listening to you today, it's, it's that moment before the next event. So it's not just an, ev an event in itself, it's that moment before the next event. I sort of want people to think, oh, he's the crazy boy that does the crazy stuff with the paint. What's he going to do next? You know, because I don't, I don't have a clue what I'm going to do next. It's going to be paint related. You know, there's lots, there's lots to be explored there yet. You know, um, in materiality, definitely. You know. This might be the last. Oh, did you? One more question, then the last question. <laughs> um, just how did you get interested in painting in the beginning? Were you always interested? in No, I went back to college, went back to school in 2009. I worked in construction for like 14 years before that. And I went back to school just actually just because of the recession, I had no job. Art was one of the subjects. The guy who was teaching me was in an adult education program. He said, you need to think about doing art in college. And I was like, okay. I had nothing to lose at that stage. You know, I had kids, no job. <clears throat> and then um, went back, done the NCAD portfolio preparation course and got into first year DOT and immediately just warmed to painting in general. I had a skill for drawing and I had a skill for doing stuff, obviously, if I got in. But paint in general, like we started off in first year looking just at the colour wheel and just throwing paint on stuff and I just got so excited by this. And then in second year, we got on to, um, in, we do a, 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 a critical theory uh, lesson every, every week. And we got on, to, we went from 1880, art history on from 1880 onwards to modern art, etc., etc. And we got to abstraction in the 1930s and 1940s, and I just never moved from that. There was just something there for me around abstraction and around Rothko. And I wrote an essay about Rothko. He, he talked in 1972, he, he wrote a letter called The Romantics of Promptings, where he argues that painting and that paint, the material of paint and the movement of paint on the canvas in itself is the work. And he got absolutely slated at the time, but it's a really, really important piece that he wrote. And I just didn't budge from that. And got spurred on to Newman by my lecture for my thesis. And once I met Newman, that was that. I was there going, this is where I need to be. You know, because that was like in the 1960s, Newman really became, and I still think he's really, really relevant right now. You know, and painting that type of work is still very relevant, you know. Definitely, you know, so that's so painting is yeah, that's where that's where that interest came from, you know. But that was kind of my question. How how you moved from construction to um, going back to college. But I suppose just uh, Mark, it's such a commitment to undertake a BA and then to go on and do an MA. Um, so you're you're obviously very committed to your practice. It's maybe it's probably way too early to say, but do you see that this is path now that you're going to go down absolutely. the life of an artist yeah. absolutely yeah. I've, I've, I've managed to get this far and it's quite difficult I have three kids under 10 it's, it's quite difficult to balance everything um, but it's the first time in my life where I've found something that I really want to do I worked for years and just waking up miserable every day you know thinking oh, work ugh, money money will make it feel better and it's not about that as I'm trying to learn, there's not much money in this, but I'm happy. You know, I gladly sit up to my eyes and paint every day. Gladly. 
no problem. You know, if I could eat the stuff, I would. You know, <laughs> so I'm okay with all that. You know, and I've managed to secure a job locally in an art shop. I've managed to get my MA now. So I'm set now for the next two years. I don't have to do anything except go and listen to me once a week and <laughs> paint. And I'm happy enough with that, you know. So finances. More than listing market. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's where I need to be, you know, for myself, you know. We did have one final question, or did we? Did you have a question, Kevin? No? Yeah. yeah. I was uh, going to make. Uh, I was going to ask about um, the local and the art uh, in terms. Of whether the local influences you. Um, you talked about the, the recycling centre, I looked at that story, I, I guess 300 tins and more, uh, I looked at. Uh, so I was going to ask you about that kind of connection between whether, whether how it impacts, because we are in Andrea, and it's marvellous to be having this conversation. You don't have to go into town and go over to dinner. We're on a local person. Mm-hmm. The other thing too is about using the paint. Mary talked about the thing. <laughs> I worked as a screen printer, not a very good screen printer years ago. And we used to, part of the, the union, when we joined the union, they said one of the things that uh, uh, when the union official came out and he said, when you're working with vinyl, you should have a pint of milk. So maybe, uh, the, maybe uh, the idea was that you, if you're going to drink the milk, it brought the, 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 you know, the elements of the, uh, Milk, eh? <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, well, my kids live here. I live here, you know, I've been living here for the last 10 years now, and um, I actually was going to do teaching for a while. So I've taught, I've done um, shadow teaching in the Hartstown, I've worked with Froigan, and you know, I've been involved within the community, and actually, the local community sponsored me to go and do my portfolio preparation in the first place. So like I probably wouldn't have got where I got without local support. You know, like I've been on social welfare since 2009, which I get across the road. So it's only now that I've started to find, and I work locally, you know. So I'm very much involved in the local area, but also well aware of the sort of logistics of the area, you know. Like I want to try and make the work as accessible for everybody as I can, but also hold on to some of what I've learned. You know, so there's a thin, thin line, especially for Drake, mm-hmm. to try and sort of keep everybody happy. Mm-hmm. You know, make it a successful sort of viable art space, mm-hmm. but also make the work successful so that when people come in, they don't feel intimidated by the works, so that they can say, actually, these are quite nice, mm-hmm. and I'm okay to say that here, and no one's looking at me, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's, that's important. And myself and Emer spoke about that a lot in relation to, the, especially in the install, mm-hmm. and will I put stuff on the ground, will I not? And so a lot of the decisions that I made around, especially the works in here, were got to do with the area. I know the area fairly well. You know, I worked and lived here for years. I didn't even know this place existed. You know, I went over there every weekend spending a fortune on stuff I couldn't afford. And the real happiness was across the road and it was free. It's such ironic, so ironic for me to know that now, you know. So yeah, so I'm very, very much conscious of the area, you know. Right, leave it there. Thanks very much for your questions and thanks very much, Mark. No worries. Thank you.